years ago, the Somali Democratic Republic appeared to be an African success story, building on a colonial legacy, natural resources, and a happy, hard-working population. A beautiful country, it potentially had everything. It was indeed a power. Then, it all went wrong. Who's criminal or have killed people? Put them away, but not me. All the international air workers come to count us and visit us like tourists. Armed guards are also based on top of the trucks. The big problem is the looters are not the forces of either side. This tragic story concerns three men. Former President Ziad Barre nearly brought peace and prosperity to Somalia. But through bad mistakes, conflicting ideologies, and the importing of vast amounts of military hardware, his legacy is devastation. This is Ali Mahadi, in charge only of the north of the divided capital, Mogadishu, with his faction, the Manifesto Group. He is not recognized outside this area, having been appointed interim president by a supposedly unconstitutional coalition in Djibouti during a power vacuum in the Civil War. Strangely, his manifesto group proclaims to be part of the United Somali Congress, the leader of which he's primarily in bloody contention with. General Muhammad Farah Aidid. He controls the southern part of the city, Mogadishu. Funded by the then ruler of neighboring Ethiopia, he couldn't completely overthrow President Siad Barre, Ali Mahdi, or the northern clans. So destroyed as much infrastructure as possible, out of spite. For a long period, he held relief agencies and the United Nations in thrall. These three hostile men have caused Somalia's descent into anarchy, devastation and starvation. But why did it happen? To understand that, Somalia's past must be looked at for the clues that mirror its present. Although used to clan rivalry, border disputes, drought and occasional famine, by the mid-1970s the Somali Democratic Republic seemed close to conquering them all. Under its authoritarian president, Siad Barre, the country appeared to have wealth, progressive infrastructure, adequate food, and a high standard of education and medication. Strategically situated on the Horn of Africa, it was being wooed by the Soviet Union, China, and the USA. The enterprising Somali population, a beautiful race descended from Arabs and North Africans, were quick to turn this aid into progress, for although mostly nomadic, they were good at business and adapting to new ways. In the late 19th century, the capital Mogadishu, its name meaning seat of the Shah in ancient Persian, was being considered by the colonial powers. They all had designs on this region, commanding the southern approaches to the Suez Canal and important sea routes along the east coast of Africa. It was an easy takeover, for the Somali elders were happy to recommend being under the protection of any nation offering friendship, a characteristic which would one day prove a destructive cocktail. The Italians were the most avaricious. Since the late 19th century, they had been racing to incorporate the whole Horn of Africa in one big colony. Eritrea was already under their influence. However, France took the northwest around Djibouti, Britain the north, and the Italians the south, by far the biggest and most productive part. 
So southern Somalis learnt Italian and Italian commercial, legal and political practices and in the north they learnt English and adopted British practices. A Somali's first loyalty is to his sub-clan, then his clan, the basis of Somali culture, and these allegiances run deep. Minor disputes, once settled with clubs and spears, would assume horrific proportions with the introduction of modern automatic weapons. To the west, the nominally Christian Ethiopian Empire also had its eyes on Somaliland. They took over the Ogaden and Haud regions, which the Somalis considered their own. The dispute over these regions angered and intimidated future president Siad Barre. It would ultimately destroy Somalia. But anti-colonial rumblings had started long before his birth, and being a Muslim country, it was religion which started them in 1898. Mohammed Abdullah Hassan, dubbed the Mad Mullah by the British troops, declared a jihad against the Christian invaders from Europe and Ethiopia. A master tactician, he could not be defeated. He died in the influenza epidemic of 1920, shortly after British bombers destroyed his fort at Tele. The dream of a united Somalia temporarily died with him. With Somali resistance broken, the Italians developed plantations around the only two areas where there are permanent rivers, the valleys of the Shabeli and the Juba. Vast quantities of bananas, sugar and cotton were soon being exported to Italy under preferential financial deals. By the 1970s, bananas alone contributed 35% of Italian Somaliland's export earnings. The British, however, were less inclined to invest in a protectorate which they saw mainly as a source of food for their more important garrison across the Straits in Aden. In August 1940, the Italians captured British Somaliland, but seven months later, Commonwealth forces retook the territory, gaining Italian Somaliland, the Haud and the Ogaden in the process. Most of the nation was now united, even if under the British. A regenerated mood of national awareness was soon disappointed. Once again, the Ogden was the cause. Ernest Bevan, the British Labour Foreign Secretary, wanted Somalia to remain united, under the British, of course. Emperor Haile Selassie, not unsurprisingly, demanded in 1949 that the area be returned to Ethiopia. The US, wanting a base in Eritrea, agreed. The UK gave the region back, and the UN ruled that Italian Somaliland be placed under a UN trusteeship for ten more years, administered by Italy. Somalia was once again divided. The UN were to play another indeterminate role in Somalia over 40 years later. In 1960, the two colonies became independent, and on the 1st of July that year, united to become the Republic of Somalia. At last, there was a prospect of a united, prosperous country, run by the Somalis themselves. But many Somalis had divided loyalties between clans, generations, and colonial influences. The armies marched differently. The legal and commercial procedures differed. And what would the official language be? Not Somali, there was no alphabet. English, Arabic or Italian? The first president, Adan Abdul Osman, and his prime minister, Abdul Rashid Ali Sharmake, began to lay the framework for what would become a successful democracy. It worked. Why it worked is because uh, people felt that the politicians can be changed through a multi-party system. So in fact the people, or I should say not the, the, the people in the, who matter in the towns, who know what politics is, felt that through these political parties they can change any leader they want. Meanwhile, a little-known army commander named Mohammed Siad Barre was becoming influential. Siad Barre, I could, I think, with all certainty I can say, 
felt that he was the reincarnation of Muhammad Abdullah Hassan. Absolute reincarnation. More elections took place in 1968, won by Shamake, an almost unique instance of a constitutional change of power in post-colonial Africa. It could not last. In 1969, President Sharmake went on a mercy mission to the northeast. He never returned. When a head of state is assassinated, it is very rare that there is not a political motive or, or a political explanation, but it may be well below the surface. It may be obscured uh, because of the interests of the parties or the importance of the parties concerned. Uh, it's easy to believe the current story that uh, a demented uh, soldier uh, made uh, a decision unrelated to political reality for personal or local reasons. But of course, we live in a period now when archives are being opened. And there is little doubt in my mind that the opening, for example, of the KGB uh, uh, archives will reveal uh, a greater depth uh, to, to these issues. And, uh, may throw some light in what historians have suspected uh, was uh, an implication, uh, an, uh, an involvement uh, in uh, Siad Bare's uh, coup d'etat. It has been mentioned uh, as a possibility by several writers, but no one as to date has produced the hard evidence. But that may now be possible. A few days later, on the 21st of October 1969, Radio Mogadishu announced that Major General Siad Bare had staged an allegedly bloodless coup. Relentlessly making decisions, he quickly consolidated his position. Proclaiming himself president, he abolished the National Assembly and personally headed an appointed 25-member Supreme Revolutionary Council. Initially, the people supported him. Born in the Ogaden, he was an anti-colonialist. Many who hadn't supported the coup were detained, including then-Colonel Mohammed Farah Aidid, who had always distrusted Bare. General I.D. and Siad Bro were in the army together. And even became, before he came to power, they were not on good terms. When he came to power, the first instructions he gave was that I.D. should be appointed a consular in the Somali embassy in Khartoum. That was two weeks after Siad Bure came to power. Tell I did refused. And within a, two weeks, again, he was put in jail. And he remained in jail for six years. So there was no love lost between the two. Attempting to do away with clan ties, he appointed people on merit, not clan affiliation. It was a refreshing break with tradition but it would not last. Barre, then gaining aid by cleverly setting superpower against superpower, was trying to turn Somalia into a modern state. While the Russians provided arms and advisors, Chinese money and loaned workers built roads into the interior and along the coast, linking towns that had never before been easily accessible. His scientific socialism was not dogmatic and instilled a feeling of optimism. His limited nationalization was also initially unauthoritarian. I, I believe the Siad Barre never bothered to read what scientific socialism was. Never bothered to read what Lenin said, what Marx said. But he believed that to get something out of the Russians, you have to proclaim that you are a socialist that you are a communist, and is the only reasoning that the Russian power accepted. In this hectic era, new government buildings were put up, factories were built, producing products as diverse as tiles, processed fish, pasta, cigarettes and matches. The fertile fishing grounds were exploited for export. Traditional exports of Somali livestock went to the Arabian Gulf countries, and the rest in demand because they were disease-free and naturally produced. Tourism was encouraged along the second longest coast of Africa. Mogadishu had stunning hotels built and safari trips exploited the varied wildlife. 
Barre also refused to listen to experts who said that things could not be done. The fertile area between the Juba and the Shabeli rivers was being overrun by sand dunes. Undaunted, Barre created a task force of civil engineers and workers who, aided by volunteers on the weekly day off, Friday, stopped the dunes' advance by planting local cacti and shrubs. It was an unqualified success. Things were going very much Siad Barre's way. In 1974, he became chairman of the Organization of African Unity, hosting meetings of African heads of states. Having traditionally close ties with Arabia, it was no surprise when he took Somalia into the Arab League. Barre's prestige and international reputation soared. Even in the West, he was admired as a pragmatist, influenced by the Soviets, but not engulfed by them. The Soviets, though, were still anxious to consolidate their gains, and wary of ongoing Western construction projects, the Americans in Ethiopia and a growing Chinese influence signed a treaty of friendship and cooperation with Barre in 1974. Over the next three years, they sent an estimated $345 million in military support alone. The former colonialism was now replaced by a superpower domination. One of the biggest problems Somalia faced was education. Outside the main towns, only 5% were literate. Stories and facts had always passed verbally from generation to generation, the Somali language having no alphabet. It took the uh, force of, of a military government, of Sir Bayer's regime, and this is one of his uh, uh, positive achievements, uh, to uh, settle this and make a, a, a decision and the Roman alphabet uh, was um, uh, accepted. The Saudis didn't like it. Barre's other great skill involved the coexistence of Islam and Italian-inspired Roman Catholicism within a supposedly atheist, Marxist, Leninist state. Barre, a chain-smoking insomniac, was now running the government as a personal enterprise and resentment was building up. However, with an economy relying for the most part on aid rather than adequate production, it began to founder. Corruption was rife. Tax avoidance a national sport. An unofficial clan-based cash economy bypassed the financial institutions, emptying the government's coffers. Now, with the country rallying behind him, Siad Barre had to look for more ambitious plans to foster his power gains and further attempt to go down in history as father of the Somali nation. One belief that would always unite the race was that ethnic Somalis in the neighboring Ethiopia and Kenya should be reunited with Somalia. Secretly, he started training a rebel movement, the Western Somali Liberation Front, within the disputed areas at first, the clandestine aggression went well. Emboldened by the fact that the pro-Western emperor Haile Selassie had been deposed, Barre launched a full-scale attack on Ethiopia in July 1977. I personally, at the time when asked, advised the Somali government not to intervene in the Ogaden. Privately, the Somali government recognized they had made a mistake when the uh, Americans and the Russians and their sycophants, the, the Cubans, and even in those days, uh, the, the, some of the Yemen regimes uh, appeared to uh, turn on the Somalis, even though the Somalis were very confident of the moral superiority of their position. But the consequences of this invasion were a complete surprise to Barre. With Mengistu's Ethiopia ideologically ripe for takeover, the Soviets changed sides in November and instead gave Mengistu Cuban and East German troops to combat Somalia. They mercilessly and indiscriminately devastated Hargeisa. Infuriated, Barre ordered all Soviet advisers to leave immediately. However, with no financial or military support, he was forced to retreat from the Ogaden in March 1978. Kept 
the Somalis together. They've always felt that they had an enemy in Ethiopia. So sometimes to keep the unity of the people, you have to cultivate an invisible enemy. And that invisible enemy was Ethiopia. And that aim was greater Somalia. He took that dream out of them. And there was no cohesive thing to keep the Somalis together. The same case in, in, in the Middle East. If today Israel gives back the Arab territories, believe you me, there will be no Arab... With Soviet benefactors gone, Barre was severely weakened. The war had crippled the country financially. He had to realign. Despite being politically unsure of Barre, the Americans were acutely aware of the growing Soviet superiority in the region. The Soviets had built major military facilities in the Dalek Islands in the Red Sea, air and naval bases in Aden, and on the island of Socotra. The US therefore signed an agreement with Barre in August 1980, giving them unlimited access to airfields and docks in Berbera, Kismayo and Mogadishu, so countering Soviet power in the region. Meanwhile, the Saudis, the biggest importers of Somali livestock, had started their ranches in Australia. Exports plummeted. Somalia was sitting on oil fields that would have been easier and cheaper to exploit than the Middle Eastern ones. The country momentarily appeared tranquil until Ethiopia's sudden revenge attacks were launched in 1982 and 83. Funded by Ethiopia, the Somali national movement based on the Izak clan waged a guerrilla war in the north. Barre found himself fighting his own people. A complex character, Barre was also prepared to give people a second chance. He had released Aidid after six years imprisonment. Resentment at his imprisonment reinforced Aidid's original dislike of Barre. A desire for revenge became increasingly apparent. An embattled army and an empty treasury forced Barre to sign a peace treaty with Ethiopia in April 1988. Deprived of its funding by the treaty, the SNM launched a desperate attack on the north, overrunning Barao and occupying part of Hargeisa. Barre was furious and unleashed the full strength of his forces against the rebels. Mercenaries bombed the rebel cities as many Somali pilots refused to kill their own people. Artillery barrages finished the job. The SNM policy militarily seemed to me to be very misguided. They rushed straight into Hargeisa, occupied a part of the, of the town and tried to hold it. Um, the, um, the government troops there then simply shelled that part of the town and used their MiG and Hunter aircraft um, to bomb it. And I've been there since, and it is a most horrific sight. I mean, they've just destroyed that part of the town. Obviously, the government forces bear the main responsibility. They actually did the shelling and the bombing. But it was a very bad military move for the, for the SNM to try and hold part of the town um, and, and conquer the rest of it. I mean, it would have been much more sensible to try and cut it off and to, to bring it down by siege um, rather than you know, just seize the town by, by force. And, of course, they were eventually forced to, with, uh, forced to withdraw from Hargeisa. Atrocities were committed by both sides. These 90 bodies in this mass grave were murdered police and government officials. Both sides deny responsibility. Barre's forces now find themselves in the same position as the British in the 1900s. Barre controlled the towns, while the SNM guerrillas adopted the Mad Mullah's tactics and controlled the bush. In an attempt to restrict the rebel movements, government forces indiscriminately mined areas where nomads congregated, particularly water wells. Five years on, these mines are still killing and maiming people, despite the efforts of international clearance teams. Well, I think uh, when uh, terrorists come to or buy or fight uh, with the aim of this, uh, disconnecting the country, any country in the world should have done this. 
This what happens in in Britain, what happens in in Italy, what happens in everywhere in the world, that there are hell of disturbance, and who have the right to defend the unity and peace and security of of his own nation should have taken some some decision or even what? In fact, he told me personally when I was an ambassador. He said I would rather like people to fear me than uh, respect me or like me. And this is the main reason why he gave instructions that Hargeisa, the second capital of Somalia, should be bombarded and raised to the ground. The savagery of his reaction to the SNM and other opposition groups convinced most of the population that he must go. And towards the end, he, he more and more uh, played off one clan against another and destroyed the old Somali leadership. I understand that a lot of the old uh, leaders, the, the sort of people who could sit down and, and work out a, a peaceful solution to a problem, um, were either imprisoned or discredited in one way or another. And so that when the, the end came, there was no common leadership in the country that could actually sit down and work out a, a solution to Somali's, prob Somali's problems. Several years after his release, Aideed had requested and obtained the ambassadorship to India. However, within two years, the Indian government, objecting to some of his political and commercial activities, asked for his recall. Avoiding Barre's attempts to isolate him, he made his way to Addis Ababa, where, with the aid of the Ethiopian government, he helped set up the United Somali Congress based on his own Hawea clan. All people have their divisions. The danger is that in times of crisis in the history of all nations, then uh, natural divisions widen. And that is the tragic situation today. Ever more insecure, Barre hit out at the slightest criticism. A prime example occurred in September 1990. In the stadium, 1990, September 1990, he was there to watch a football game. Few people booed at him. He couldn't accept that. How could somebody shout at me? And the soldiers with him had to open fire. A lot of people, not less than 500 people were killed at that time. Meanwhile, the population of Mogadishu rebelled and joined by Aidid's militia, forced Barre to flee to Gedo. Nobody overthrew me. I left Mogadishu. If I could have preserved the, uh, the life of the people and, uh, and uh, the property, the social property of the country. And uh, therefore, I believe, not because I believe, but I am the president of Somalian government up to now. In hot pursuit, Aidid's forces indulged in an orgy of murder, rape and looting. 500 were bayoneted to death against this pillar. These men were tortured to extort their savings. His name is again? His name is Haji Muhammad. Aidid's absence, a conference in Djibouti appointed Ali Mahdi interim president. The millionaire hotelier was only recognized as president by his own Abgal sub-clan, centered on Mogadishu. Aidid's attempt to remove Mahdi led to intense fighting in mid-November 1991. <coughs> The 
the centre of Mogadishu was destroyed in a few days. The ferocity of the troops was inflamed by cocktails of looted drugs in addition to the traditional cat, a mild narcotic leaf chewed by most Somalis. We managed to open the casualty department on December the 10th in Digfa and from then until now we have uh, admitted nearly 8,000 casualties, half of whom have had to have major surgery and many of whom have suffered as a result of infections. Um, they've come in with broken legs, broken arms, artillery uh, injuries that are very, very difficult to keep clean in this kind of environment. As the fighting died down, a no man's land was established across the city. Ali Mahdi ruled the north, Aidid the south. Indiscriminate shelling terrorized the civilian population. General I did send three bombs um, which struck the heart of the market, killing 10 people instantly and wounding um, 34 people. Most of these were women and children. Systematic looting was rife. Even the street lighting cables were ripped up for the copper. Relief supplies were raided. The beginning of 1992 was marked with care by uh, having 8,000 tonnes of food looted from our warehouse at the port. Uh, this looting was followed by three months of inactivity uh, whilst the ceasefire was being negotiated in Mogadishu. With the docks under fire, the only access was through Mogadishu Airport in the south. This was exploited by the gunmen. Even the UN had to hire protection. The Red Cross policy of unloading across beaches from ships anchored up to a mile offshore worked. But the North needed an air link. The task fell to Alistair Dawson of UNICEF. Within seven days, the first plane landed. And UNICEF we decided to build a new airstrip altogether, which is this one here. From the time we actually started constructing it, within seven days we had our first King Air land here at which time it was very narrow still, and uh, not so long. Wells were dug for the displaced people camping outside the city. At the beginning of March 1992, James Jonah, a top UN envoy, negotiated a ceasefire and peace corridor across the city. Two days later, a UN relief convoy attempted the first run through the corridor. There are sort of looters on the way, and this is what we're protecting ourselves against by having such a gunship in front of us, and also one travelling behind us. Armed guards are also based on top of the trucks as well, to try and keep um, I guess security as possible and a deterrent from the looters. This is the big problem, is the looters are not the forces of either side, it's just the individual looters trying to get hold of the materials to, so they can sell it and get it onto the market and make money out of it. We're having to abandon the convoy and leaving Zainab to look after it. We're now having to head as alone straight to uh, President Ali Mahdi's house as we gather there is shelling coming from the north towards uh, the port and this is stopping the ship from being able to dock. I suddenly realized we're passing through the corridor uh, going from south to north and we don't even have an armed guard on board. This has got to be the first time as well. <laughs> Uh, Roger, reading you, um, just now um, turn the corner, we're now heading down towards no man's land. Over. Copy, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. I understand the North Face shelling is coming up from the south, over. Roger, affirmative, affirmative. 
The president is very, very disappointed in what is happening. He is very, very upset, and the shelling is certainly not coming from this side. Over. Okay, understood. The same day, a shipload of food was turned away when it was shelled. Profiteers, it seemed, were intent on keeping prices high. Are you in one debate? Mobile one debate. Come in, mobile one. Uh, the trucks have satisfactorily arrived here at our north office. Over. That's a tremendous breakthrough for us to get the three trucks through. I'm very, very happy and pleased about that. This shows a way that we can start increasing it. Maybe tomorrow we can push it up to four or five trucks. I'm thrilled about it. It's wonderful. To the south and west, the war continued. And in mid-April, Siad Barre attempted a counter-attack. I plan to return to Mogadishu in order to bring it back to peace and security and justice among the people. Securing an agreement with Ali Mahdi, Aidid met Barre's army at Afgoy, south of Mogadishu. Aidid won. And he will never go to exile. Abandoning his principles, Barre went into exile. Population displacement was massive. Many fled to neighboring Kenya and Ethiopia. International response was slow and inadequate. These people were reduced to eating boiled skins and lived in appalling conditions. There was little prospect of help. On the 3rd of May, the MV Felix, chartered by the World Food Programme, entered Mogadishu port. It is our hope that this arrival of the ship will open up the port of Mogadishu, not only to supply Mogadishu, but just to supply the whole of central and southern Somalia. 7,000 tons of wheat were unloaded in five days and distributed by the charity CARE to both sides of the divided city. Most of this food got to the needy, but some distribution centers were in the hands of black marketeers. An EEC team restored a temporary main water supply and the UN organized the clearance of accumulated rubbish before the expected rains caused its decomposition. Outside Mogadishu, the combination of civil war and drought was causing a major famine, affecting up to four million people. In Bay Province, around Baidoa, hundreds were dying every week. Families were decimated. Many survivors were walking skeletons. In Baidoa, the situation there is very, very bad. You walk out in the morning, it is absolutely no problem to see 10, 15 dead bodies lying around. Unfortunately, it costs money to bury these people. Uh, it costs the princely sum of one dollar to, to bury a child in Baidoa, but that is beyond the means of most people. So they're just abandoning them in the hope that somebody else with a few bob in his pocket is going to be able to pay for people to take away the dead bodies and bury them properly. So we're finding people abandoned, buried, with no family, with no mourners, with no friends. Dreadful situation. This little boy's mother had just died, leaving him alone in the world. This baby died in his mother's arms. The 500 lightly armed UN troops guarding the docks and airport were incapable of ensuring security elsewhere. Sporadic and inadequate convoys were escorted by hired local gunmen.
America's donation of 140,000 tonnes of food and giant transport aircraft allowed a sustained effort to control the situation. I think it's great to see the food coming in. I think we're all, we're all very pleased that it has come at last. For, for many, it's too late. Um, we've seen the sites around Baidoa. Last month, you may have heard that uh, 3,194 bodies were picked up in a truck for burial. These were the people that had been abandoned. So for many, it's too late, but for some, it's OK. We're delighted to see it coming. <laughs> But there was little security beyond Mogadishu. Aid workers found it increasingly difficult to operate. Well, there were enough blankets to distribute to everybody that was there yesterday. We had more people in there today. Some people got in without armbands. What can you do? Put a barbed wire fence around it seems to be what we need. I mean, so then those gunshots went off. I mean, I don't know how many people there have guns, but we had 20 security for this camp, and it's obviously not enough. Relief agencies called for a stronger UN military presence, but UN officials dithered. But I think looking around at what we are faced with, we need something to neutralize it. At the moment, you are at the mercy of the larger gun. You bring the food, it can be looted. If a group comes in with bigger guns, then you have to protect it. If the, the presence of the UN can offer protection for this food, that we can get it to those who are really starving, I think then it, it would add something. But what I'm saying is that one needs to consider this in a, in a broader light and much more depth. I've not done that. You must talk your way out of the present groups who are occupying the port. In the absence of a centralized authority which can impose its will on them. You have this problem of one side of the two authorities very willing for the UN to come in and play some specific roles, but the other side is not ready yet. It's still under negotiation. The head of UNISOM Ambassador Mohamed Sanoun publicly criticized UN policy and was forced to resign. The result was inevitable. A US transport plane was fired on. The aid stopped. General Aidid refused to accept more UN troops, claiming that they would constitute a new form of colonialism. His control over his militia was questioned. You control a force when you are paying them salaries, when you are paying them rations, when you can confine them to barracks. The force with ID are not controlled by him because he had nothing to offer them. They have their own guns, they buy their ammunition, they do things on a crime basis. He can't give them instructions. He needs them, they don't need him. ID's bluff was called by President Bush who unilaterally decided to send in 28,000 Marines. Their role was non-confrontational. The clan militias were left alone. All the arms that was given to Somalia by the Russians. In fact, the arms today can last the Somalis for another five years. One thing that Somalia could export today are arms. Only time will tell whether these efforts will be adequate and whether the factions will lay down their arms and cooperate to rebuild the nation. You can't avoid blaming Somali, the Somali people, for, in a way, for what has happened. But they could have foreseen that their social structure might, uh, and their belief in, in, in war as a way of solving dispute of just picking up a gun before you finish talking uh, might lead to such a catastrophe. I think the two colonial powers, Britain and Italy, by dividing uh, Somalia in the first place, uh, obviously have 
some blame in this. And then being strategically placed in the Horn of Africa, of course, Somalia became a pawn of, of the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, and both of them armed the government of Somalia at one stage or another. The United Nations role in Somalia has been absolutely disgraceful. Um, it was, it, uh, the whole situation really came to a head at the height of the Gulf War, uh, which didn't help Somalia at all because everyone's attention was focused a little further north. Um, but it also happened at a time when Perez de Crea was ending his um, secretary generalship. And uh, it, it wasn't until Boutros Ghali took over that anyone paid a slightest attention to Somalia. It'll be a long, hard road to reconciliation and the end of Somalia's nightmare. collapsed with exhaustion. We gave him some water and the first food he'd had in five days. He'd set out ten days before with his mother and father to try and reach Walanwain, 140 miles from Baidoa. They had both died on the journey and the others he had been with had abandoned him because he could not walk fast enough. With care's help he's now awaiting medication and has been taken in by a care officer. He might qualify eventually for a place in an SOS orphanage. It is a mercy mission, but it turned into a war. American soldiers went to Somalia to feed the starving and ended fighting those they came to save. When American soldiers got killed, they pulled out. Tonight, we speak with the men who sent them in. You fear the withdrawal sends damaging signals. The message that sent to the rest of the world is if you have peacekeeping operations and you don't like the way they're being conducted, and there are Americans there, kill the Americans because it'll lead them to a quick shift in, in their position in regard to the peacekeeping operations. We track down the warlord the Americans failed to find. The condemnation should be directed to those who plan it to uh, undertake this unprovoked war. We meet the helicopter pilot whose capture would alter the direction of the war. I just laid that, the weapon across my chest and I just put my hands on it. I guess I was pretty sure that they were going to kill me at that point.
This is the battleground where the Americans found themselves at war. Today, the Somali capital, Mogadishu, remains dangerous and tense. Militiamen like these, loyal to the warlord general Aidid, rule the streets. Despite American intervention, these men could easily push the country back into civil war. Feared mistakes made in Somalia could jeopardize other peace missions elsewhere. This is the story of what went wrong. The images of brutal starvation are so painful. The children are so frail, so innocent. Reach out. You have the power to help relieve tremendous suffering. Don't turn away from these innocent girls and boys. Join our emergency phone list now and change the faces of starvation into the beginning of hope. Call that way. It started 18 months ago. The images of famine shocked America. But gunmen in Somalia were preventing food convoys reaching the starving. President Bush had resisted sending troops to Bosnia, but his advisers thought there was a chance of saving lives in Somalia without getting enmeshed in a war. The United Nations didn't have the military muscle and was lobbying America. I remember Big Fiscali uh, himself telling the president that there was a perception in much of the third world, especially the Islamic world, that the West was using the UN for its own purposes. And that when we wanted to intervene, uh, then the UN intervened. When we didn't, uh, then, uh, uh, then nothing was done. And this was an opportunity to gain a very poor third world country, but a Muslim country uh, and a black country. The world could not stand by and allow, allow hundreds of thousands of people to die in Somalia. We had a responsibility. We are a great nation. Peacekeeping is an important responsibility. I felt that it was important for us to engage in. I think that we took the moral high ground during that period. The White House, under pressure from politicians, the public, and the press, finally decided to send in troops. Only the United States has the global reach to place a large security force on the ground in such a distant place, quickly and efficiently, and thus save thousands of innocents from death. The United Nations gave America unique powers to intervene. They authorized the use of military force, even though the country they were going to had not invited them. I believe it was an historic resolution. It was a very important resolution. It reinforced the United Nations, it reinforced the new role of the United Nations, and will help the Somali people. In the case of Somalia, we have a territory, we have a population, but you have no government. And this is why we were, in a certain way, compelled to intervene without the agreement of the government. We obtained the agreement of certain gangs, certain groups, but there was no government. The brightest and the best were drafted in. The operation took just weeks to plan. It started with the best of intentions to feed the starving people of Somalia. But the powers that be in Washington could not have realized that in the months that followed, the focus of the mission would shift, and hundreds of Somalis and scores of peacekeeping servicemen would lose their lives. What small mistakes made in Somalia would have serious implications for peacekeeping missions elsewhere. The country the U.S. troops were coming to was locked in civil war. The various clans were slugging it out for supreme power. Each warlord, like a medieval baron, had his own private army. The gunmen robbed food convoys. They demanded extortionate amounts of protection money to let them through. The starving were not being fed. The U.S. Secretary of State himself remembers laying down the ground rules on how America would deal with the militiamen. 
I think I made it clear that we were prepared to engage in disarming to the point necessary to accomplish the feeding of the people. I mean, in other words, there was going to have to be some security established on the ground if we were going to be successful in feeding people, but that, that was the end of it. We were not there particularly or principally to disarm the contending party. A former ambassador to Somalia was sent ahead as America's special envoy to broker a ceasefire. He confronted the various warlords separately with an offer they could hardly refuse. I said, look, the world is now coming led by the United States to try to prevent this country from committing suicide. We already have 300,000 people killed. The country is in ruins. Uh, the international community will come in and help you. And the President of the United States is determined to do this. And we want to do it peacefully. But you understand the military capability of the United States. You saw it in Desert Storm. And it's going to be here in two days. And you'll have your alternative of working with the international community and cooperating with us while facing very tough, very powerful military pressure, which will overwhelm you. And what's the choice? One man controlled the vital port and airport districts where the troops would land. The powerful warlord General Mohammed Farah Aidid. Most Americans had scarcely heard of him, but this man more than any other would damage their mission. We found General Aidid in a luxury hotel in Kenya, completing a foreign tour. He told us how 15 months ago he'd welcomed the announcement the Americans were coming. Uh, when uh, this announcement was done, we Somalis believe it, and uh, we welcome. Operation Restore Hope began auspiciously. The Marines landed in a blaze of publicity. Even in this far corner of the world, the international press had been forewarned. A group of soldiers captured the first Somalis they encountered. <laughs> Only to discover they were in fact legitimate workers from the airport. <laughs> In all, more than 20,000 troops were sent to Somalia. It was just before Christmas, and they were welcomed by crowds of people weary of famine and war. The streets of Mogadishu were littered with people, brightly coloured clothes, Rice was being thrown, women were ululating, every wall along the airport and seaport was just covered with young children, men. It, absolutely everybody was ecstatic. Never in the history of this short episode would Americans be so popular here. Nearing the end of his presidency, it was a last hurrah for George Bush. People believe that food will be brought into the country, jobs will be created, the commercial marketplace will be revitalized, and that some form of political reconciliation would happen sooner rather than later. But that was not what the Americans planned. In those early days, the troops had a clear objective, to open the roads and get food through, and then go home. The United Nations also wanted them to disarm the militiamen, but America did not want to be drawn into confrontation at the provider.